Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Hang with me now, hang with me now. Now our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, Instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. Okay, okay, hang on. You, you are at the Ransomed Heart Podcast. You don't, don't tune us off just yet. Those of you English majors will recognize the opening monologue from Richard III, Shakespeare's play, uh, and hang with me, there's a reason here. Richard is a devious man. Richard is the alleged, you know, protagonist of the play. But he is describing in this opening monologue how his brother, who is this son of York, um, sunshine son, bringing light and goodness to England, has just, you know, brought peace um, to the land in the War of the Roses here towards the end of the War of the Roses. Richard is actually upset by that because now everyone's turning back to domestic life and romance and love and that sort of thing. And he is not and he is bitter about it. The issue is that Richard is physically deformed, um, perhaps badly physically deformed, and, and therefore in a culture of beauty, he finds himself the object of shame and fear and derision. So uh, he's going to go on and explain sort of his plot in the play. He says, But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I that am rudely stamped, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Okay, so now he's going to say, and therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these farewell-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Shakespeare's play is essentially about envy, which is the subject of our series here. Um, welcome to the Ransom Tar Podcast, John Eldridge, um, with my son Blaine in the studio for reasons that will become clear to you momentarily. One of the things that Blaine and I enjoy doing is swapping what we've been reading, sharing kind of interesting historical facts, riffing off on different philosophers and why we like them or don't like them. And for the past several months, this topic keeps coming back up, this topic of envy. And and not just between Blaine and I, but with the staff, um, conversations that I've had uh, numerous times with Dan Allender, just a number of different people. This seems to be a big one, gang, and therefore we think we have a very powerful series for you. We think we can shed some light on what is actually one of the most dangerous, what would you call it, devices of the enemy in our day, right? So let, let's just riff for a minute. Blaine, when I, th when I throw envy at you, what do you think? Well, I go right to etymology for obvious reasons. I go to the Latin um, underpinnings of the word. And you mentioned before we got started, I tossed it to you, that it does come from invidere, to look. But it actually, the word envy uh, comes from to look upon with malice. And for that reason, it's um, it's interesting to me, the psychologist Mary Lemia provides a pretty helpful distinction between envy and jealousy. And she actually says that jealousy is a personal emotion 
And jealousy begins with feeling that we have lost something because of some real change in our circumstances, whereas envy is entirely about seeing another person's virtue and feeling contempt for it. Yeah, that malice piece, I just, you give a little shudder at it because the first thing we want to clarify, gang, is envy. Envy is not the same thing as admiration. Envy is not the same thing as um, emulation of like, well, you Mm -hmm. know, he's so good at that sport, I want to get good too. Envy is not healthy. It It doesn't have a healthy side to it. In fact, just riffing back and forth on envy, envy is the first sin. Mm. Envy is the Mm -hmm. oldest sin. Envy goes back before the garden. Envy goes back into the time before time when Satan falls from heaven. And the, you know, scriptures that were given on on his fall and some of the Old Testament descriptions of his vanity, certainly there was pride in there, but also he wanted the glory of God for himself. He, He wasn't content merely to honor it and serve it. And so, like Richard III, there is this malice to it. There is this dark thing. Mm -hmm. You make me think of uh, Francis Bacon writing on Envy, said, we who cannot attain another's virtue are content to destroy their fortune. Yeah. Envy is high up there on the the list of seven deadly sins, Uh, a concept almost completely lost totally lost to modern culture, but almost completely lost even to the church. Which is fascinating because given that the seven deadly sins kind of existed as a series of warnings of things that were poisonous to the soul. Like they didn't come out of nowhere. They actually came out of thoughtful reflection on what are things that will destroy a person if they infect them. And envy is at the top of the list. It will destroy a human soul if it takes root there. Yeah. Proverbs says, envy rots the bones. That's fascinating because as we began to kind of riff on this a little bit, I started doing some reading. Um, Joseph Epstein has a marvelous little book on envy, which was actually derived from a series of lectures um, on the seven deadly sins given in New York a number of years ago. But one of the things that he says— is envy is the hardest sin to recognize because he says, envy may be the subtlest, perhaps I should say the most insidious of the seven deadly sins, um, largely because who wants to admit this? Yes. Right? Who wants to to kind of fess up? You know, we'll fess up to anger. We'll we'll, we'll fess up to lust, right? We'll, We'll confess these things, but there's just something so petty about envy that who wants? Which is why it's so fascinating. You mentioned Proverbs. There's another one in Proverbs 18 where, you know, it says, anger is fierce, wrath is unbearable. Who can stand before envy? And so even while it's set up as being something totally destructive, you're totally right in saying we don't want to own up to this fundamental malice that we feel in response to virtue. It's the craziest thing because envy is actually produced by something. It comes in response to something we should feel admiration for, the athlete whose abilities we simply will never reach, the artist whose you know, skill with paint is unattainable to us. And instead of feeling you know, like, praise or anything like admiration, what we actually feel is hatred for a virtue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, here's what we're going to do in the opening of this series. We're going to kind of give you an overview of some places we want to go in unpacking this insidious thing that's actually become so common in our culture. I think most people don't even recognize it as, Mm. as deadly. I certainly didn't. Until we began to feel actually some of the effects of the warfare mm-hmm. of envy, I really sort of wrote it off as kind of lower down on the list of sort of embarrassing personal flaws, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, kind of kind of down there with fear of heights or, or str- just strange little quirks of the personality as opposed to something that's truly formidable. Yes. And that the inability— 
to admire that which is greater than you is a radical, radical concept yes. and very weighty. And we're going to go there. We're going to come back to and, and unpack that big time in a, in a later part of this series. But what began to open this up was actually some conversations around the harm of envy. A friend of mine is on the pastoral staff of a large church, a um, number of uh, administrators, pastors, counselors. You know, good. It's a good, big, healthy thing that they have going on. For some uh, unfortunate reason, it may be the it may be the warfare set against that particular body of people, but many of the members of the staff do not have good marriages. Their marriages are in various states, um, from disappointing to divorce. And um, my friend, serving on the staff of this church, actually has a wonderful marriage. And he and his wife just just have they just love each other, and they're best friends and. And he was talking about what it felt like to live under the envy of other people for his marriage mm. and, and some of the actual kind of damaging effects of that. Yeah, man. It's a painful story because it's so familiar. You know, when Em and I had our daughter, we realized this pattern was happening with warfare where we would like post an update of our life, either of our pregnancy or, you know, of our six-week-old daughter who everyone wanted to see on Facebook. And after we had posted to social media, the warfare we would experience the next evening and throughout the next day was like so ferocious. We'd be kind of circling the wagons looking for like, where is this coming from? What? And what we actually realized was, oh my goodness, this is being unleashed by the envy of people. And so we actually had to make the decision in our marriage and especially in our family that we won't post anymore like photos or any other meaningful update because when we put our life in front of people, mm. what we kept getting back was this kind of firestorm of people's envy. Mm -hmm. And and listeners, again, we're, we've got a whole lot to unpack for you here, but I want to talk in two directions. As Blaine was saying, the, the seven deadly sins, the list of that was created centuries ago for our benefit. You know, here are things to to guard your soul from because they're so damaging. You know, pride being mm -hmm. one, wrath being another, lust being another, and, and envy in the list. So, so you have the internal things we want to talk about and be more holy people. But, but the category that I think is is actually pretty surprising is actually envy coming your direction, envy mm -hmm. coming at you, and the damaging effects that it actually has. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Facebook because there was a fascinating study. That came out of, um, I don't know if you saw this, out of those German universities a couple of years ago. They did some research on it, and, and what they found is that one person in three feels worse yes. after visiting social networking sites and says that their general dissatisfaction with life has increased. Yes. And then they go on to say just some really... It's tragic, it's haunting, it's creepy, um, because it's just so close to human nature and so close to what we're living with. Holiday photos are the biggest cause of resentment, causing Jeez. more than half of all feelings of envy. Jeez. And, and what's so difficult about this, gang, is um, more on this later, but I'm aware of it. Like, suffering is a breeding ground for envy. And so, you know, you get on social media and the problem is you're seeing people whose lives appear to be happier than yours, right? right? Um, social interaction is the second most common cause of envy, according to this study that came out in 13. As users see how many birthday greetings they receive compared to their friends, how many likes or comments are made on photos and postings, mm. right? People aged in their mid-30s, are most likely to envy family happiness. These feelings of envy prompt some users to boast more about their achievements to make themselves appear more successful than they really are. 
and then kind of here's was their conclusion. Success, talents, and possessions lead to reactions of envy, the researchers said. Everyone who's posting is always trying to depict themselves as well as possible, and therefore the posts are predominantly positive. I think people can relate to that. Okay, so just so you know, this isn't a finger-pointing podcast or series. We, we want to unpack something that, in order to get free from yes. it, right? Both directions. You know, it's, and as you talk about both directions, man, it's so painful hearing those things because it begins to point out things on the one hand in my life where I've seen someone's happiness and rather than responding with blessing, have felt this souring thing. Um, and I think even as in this conversation, it's helpful for me to remember that, you know, just as the seven deadly sins are there to like kind of help you, to give you warnings, finding places of envy I know in my own life mm-hmm. and replacing it with blessing mm-hmm. will do me enormous good. Yeah. And understanding how to respond to people's envy of you will do you enormous good. I remember Mm -hmm. one time we met this couple fly fishing and after kind of winning them over and like and becoming friends, it was a husband and wife and the wife just started sharing about how one of the things that she was uh, excited about in her life was this kind of return of joy. She was hoping for joy. Joy was a theme. And she was like, and it's so funny because I play bridge with, she was an older uh, woman, and I, I play bridge with some of the ladies in my community. And she's like, and as I've been pursuing joy, I've been finding, you know, like I'm getting good cards and I'm loving the game. And then her face, do you remember this? Just falls and she goes, but you know what the problem is with when that starts happening? Your friends kind of turn on you. And her, she was describing that all of a sudden she yeah. was receiving envy because of her perceived happiness. Yeah. And knowing what to do about that, as I know we're going to talk quite a bit about later, will be very helpful. I've had people come up to me in various conference settings. So these would not be intimate friends. These would be acquaintances or or simply readers of my work. And they'll come up and they'll say something to the effect of, I envy your relationship with God. You know, particularly it tends to be around the ability to hear his voice, the ability to walk intimately with him. And in fact, all the way back when Sacred Romance came out, uh, we were at a wedding of a friend and this woman I did not even know comes up to me, and and it, it was you know it was meet and greet. We're in that we're in that reception hour after the wedding, and so hello, how are you? I'm so and so, yeah. And when she hears my name, her response was, "Ah, the spoiled brat of God." Jeez! <laughs> that oh my gosh! Okay, I mean, because I've you know. I've had that from people too. And I remember reading a review about a writer. I think it was Annie Dillard. And like this reviewer was like, man, she has a voice to be admired and frankly envied. And I was like sitting there reading, looking at this review and like, what you've just said is she has a voice that makes you want to raid her house and burn her possessions and bring as much ruin on her as possible because she's good at something. Like, oh my, when a person comes up and confesses envy, Mm. I kind of feel like I'm ready for like the next thing of like, and I repent also for unleashing cursing against you. I'm really sorry that I didn't bless you. Exactly, exactly. I I had another uh, man who was in a little bit more of a repentant posture, but he was saying he could not watch the motorcycle movie we made. He couldn't watch it. And the reason why was the, the relationship between father and son and the relationship between generations and simply friendships was what he mostly named was was so painful for him to watch he he couldn't take it now thankfully he caught himself in that and didn't go to envy but um dorothy sayers the english novelist writer preacher spokesman gave a lecture on the seven deadly sins as well and um was turned into a pamphlet and she says envy hates to see other men happy It begins by asking plausibly, here's the good beginning, here's where it begins, why should I not enjoy 
what others enjoy. And it ends by demanding, why should others enjoy what I may not? Mm. Right? It's that, it's that horrible shift from, I wish I had what they had, which could take you into beautiful places in your prayer life. It yes. could take you to beautiful places with God. You know, the Psalms are filled with, Lord, come for me. Where are you? Why don't you go out with us anymore? How come we can't find you? You know, there's, that's right. okay. Longing's okay. Uh, emptiness that you bring to God is okay. But the shift of, why should others enjoy what I may not? And she goes on to say, envy is the great leveler. Ooh, if it cannot level things up, it will level them down. And the words constantly in its mouth are, my rights and my wrongs. At its best, envy is a climber and a snob. At its worst, it is a destroyer. Rather than having anybody happier than itself, it will see us all miserable together. Jeez. <laughs> right? You're right to begin with. This is the original sin of the enemy because I think of uh, Satan's many monologues in Paradise Lost. Just looking at some recently, I was again struck by like, dang, Milton, you had unusual insight into this <laughs> diabolical <laughs> mind, man. I don't know what your issues were. Poor tortured soul. Uh, but what Milton identifies so well in the personality is that desire to level. Like, you know, if anyone's familiar with Paradise Lost, um, you know that Satan's aspiration is to make a hell of heaven. It's the line he gives. And whenever he's talking about what he's hoping to achieve in the world, mm. he's not hoping to regain his position. Right. Uh, he knows he can't, which is why the envy doesn't have very much to do with, like, mm. I wish my life were very different. Mm. Like, the aspiration of the enemy in Paradise Lost is to destroy as much as he possibly can to cause God the greatest wound possible. Mm. Since the momentum is there, and I'm already thinking about it, it feels pretty true that at some point, envy always corresponds to a distrust of God. Mm, it really does. And, and again, we're, you know, it, it can begin in fairly benign expressions, but, but Milton gets to the core of it. He goes, you want to see the full expression of this? Yes. You want to see the wasting power of this thing? Oz Guinness has written a little bit on it as well, and he says, Envy is the second deadly sin, the second worst, and the second most prevalent. It's unique because it's the one vice that its perpetrators never enjoy. <laughs> right? I mean, at least you enjoy gluttony for a bit. You enjoy lust for a bit, right? They're, the other one's pride, right? In unhealthy ways. But the reason right. people indulge in them is because they... They bring a level of of satisfaction yeah, at least. Yeah, yeah. Right? But how how fascinating for him to say it's the one vice that people never enjoy and rarely ever confess. That's why it remains so hidden, right? When in fact it's probably the most widespread mm. of the vices. Mm. So massively, massively prevalent. And again, I think there are some reasons why. One has to do with something you were mentioning the other day when we were we were just riffing on this, and it was out of that that we said, hey, let's do a podcast series. This is going to be really helpful for people. You were talking about radical egalitarianism. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sort to of go back to the beginning of that thought as we're talking about envy. I mean, what I was realizing is, oh, it's pretty shocking to people to find that the kingdom of God is not egalitarian. Not everybody gets exactly the same thing. In fact, the kingdom of God is like fundamentally uninterested in equality. You pointed out the parable of the workers and those who work all day and those who work half a day get paid the same. Like Jesus is basically uninterested in like equal remuneration or anything else. Like virtues aren't evenly distributed riches across the earth, even like geographically, like there's not a mountain range in every state. What we have instead is like this variety right. uh, of beauty and like contrast. Ten talents, five talents, exactly. one talent. But, you know, 
since we live in an age that has totally lost that, like our high aspiration is a radical form of egalitarianism, a radical form of equality. But it's interesting from Francis Bacon of, we know we cannot attain another's virtue. So what we do instead is try to make everyone's happiness exactly the same. And the idea that we should all have the same gifts from God and the same uh, virtues and even the same callings, like that is an insane, ungodly concept that is actually one of our modern afflictions. Okay, I, I, I can feel it inside me. So I just have to pause and go, listener, do you feel that thing rising in you? Do you feel the hair going up on the back of your neck? Like people do not like the direction that we're saying. I mean, um, there's this wonderful scene I'm remembering in Chariots of Fire, you know, from obviously, you know, decades and decades ago. But Eric Little's father, who was a very, very godly man, is having this argument with an unbeliever um, who happened to be Eric's athletic manager. And, and he says, the kingdom of God is not a democracy. Yes. It's not a democracy. Yes. There, there, is an, there is an inordinate distribution of gifts and talents and situations. And if that is not something you can delight in, you can feel that you can, that thing rising up that just like... Yeah, which is why like I'm actually fairly convinced that envy is kind of the final point of a very rational worldview because I love that in the screw tape letters c.s lewis describes the outlook of the kingdom of darkness as realism uh or in you know he toes the mm. line between calling it our frank rationalism yeah. because you know you can really look and be like well there's not a reason i can imagine that you know people should be different so i can logically conclude that perfect equality is actually best but then you can kind of counter and go like um well there's not a reason for jesus to intervene and die for you what there is is radical sacrificial love and blessing and generosity and all of the logics of the kingdom which are totally alien to you know a coldly rational yeah. mind uh, or an envious mind, but are fairly wonderful. Yeah, like Richard III's mind. Yes. Right? Coldly rational and in the end, deadly. Before we close, we actually really do need to pray because this is such a potent, potent subject. And it's something the enemy has been using for a long time without a lot of discussion and without a lot of exposure on it. I don't want this to go wrong in unhealthy directions. And he's going to want to bring in confusion and accusation and and just sour this. So let, just right away, right here, before we go, Jesus, we bring all this conversation under your love, your love, Lord Jesus, your celebration of each and every person and your unique way to just delight, delight in all of our uniquenesses without envying. And so, Lord, we, we bring our conversation and, and, and we bring our understanding, we bring our hearing of this, we bring our interpretation of this under the love of Jesus Christ and under the kingdom of God so that it, it just can't be soured or accessed um, by any other thing, by accusation or fear or any of it, Lord. We just bring it all under the love of God and ask you exclusively, rule here, Jesus, exclusively. You alone, rule in this. In your name we pray. So friends, as I said, I, I think we've got something really, really big for you, and it's going to really help you understand the culture you live in, and maybe some of the destructive things that are coming against you that you never even labeled, and maybe some things within us that we can Oh, just frame in a much, much healthier way as we understand how the kingdom operates and the joy of admiration and, and the ability to live in that place. So, um, more to come. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast with John and Blaine Eldridge. 